so Sophie Constant, who is um, just starting to think about uh, her project. And I think you're going to talk to us today about BirdNet. Over to you. Oh, I just want to say hello to everybody. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen. I'm including computer sound because I've got like a couple of recordings of bird song in here as well. Um, just full disclosure, I'm quite nervous public speaking, but I've just got a couple of things in here. So um, I'm not sure of everyone's knowledge around machine learning. So I've kind of got like a basic explainer and then also the same for audio. And I just wanted to know if that's needed. So if people could just sort of let me know uh, now, which would be great. I think it would be good to go through an introduction and make it accessible to anybody who might watch the video or be watching. I think an intro would be good. OK, great. So, um, yeah, I'll get on with it. So this is my presentation on BirdNet, which is about songs sung to the machines. Um, I've just gone through the content there. And then basically BirdNet was developed in partnership with the um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the Shenitz University of Technology. It's a machine learning application that identifies and classifies birds by their vocalization and can do so focally and as part of a soundscape. Um, its applications could include cost-effective biodiversity monitoring, it could analyze birdsong within communities, and then also look at the multiple bird species within a soundscape. It could be used for research studies, it can identify songs which are difficult for humans to interpret. Um, this is because birds listen to things differently to human beings. They can interpret a greater complexity of tones across time. So I think of it as if anyone can kind of remember old phone tones, and then when we suddenly move to polyphonic phone tones, I kind of imagine humans sort of listening in the old kind of phone tones and birds listening in the polyphonic kind of phone tones, just as a metaphor. It can also identify species presence, um, species richness and do occupancy modelling. And, oh, and then on to the sort of explainer of um, machine learning. So the overall objective is to achieve a minimum cost function. And that's the difference between a predicted and actual output. And that's the difference between your training data and your validation. Um, so basically you want to identify something with as few steps as possible. Sorry, flies just flown onto my glasses. Um, and then you also want to kind of identify what weights and biases will achieve a minimum cost function, and that's your validation stage. The building basics are you've kind of got a data acquisition period, data pre-processing, then the actual model architecture itself, and then a training, and then the validation. And the training is where you kind of, um, you know, you train your model on a bunch of labeled items, which could be sound, it could be images. And then your validation is where you kind of see how successful it is at recognizing um, the items which are trying to be, which it's trying to analyze, well, which it's analyzing, but trying to correctly recognize. Um, in your data pre-processing stage, there might be a period of data augmentation, which is where you kind of do things to say it's an image, you might flip them around or rotate them. Um, and then I'm going to go into a bit later what this particular team did with the audio uh, to try and increase. Um, I guess it's increasing the training data. Ed, would you agree? Yeah. Um... I would say augmentation is like um, <clears throat> if you take a picture of a of a cat, you might have another picture of the same exact cat in the same angle that's blurry, or maybe you turn the camera and the the picture of the cat was like this, or maybe somehow the image got stretched and the cat was the pixels that comprised the cat were wide and and squashed horizontally and 
all of those things and many more are used in data augmentation. And the way that I, I think it functions is to take uh, all those little features that we imagine that the model is predicting and uh, transform them so that they're, it, you can capture the variation of all the raw data that you have and haven't. But it's a little bit of a trick because you um, you just use the the data set that you have, and this adds a lot of variation to it that you might expect. That's the way that I would describe it. Same thing with audio files and other kinds of data too. Yeah, it's like it's one of those concepts I'm. process and then this is what the architecture looks like in kind of an abstract way so you've got a bunch of node layers and that sort of pertains to these bits here can you see my mouse sort of waving around okay and then yes we can see it okay so you've got a layer of inputs and then you've got some hidden layers and these hidden layers are where the computations happen for the model architecture to sort of begin to recognize the input. So be that an image, be that a, be a bit of sound. And then you've got like an output layer, which is where you see whether or not it has recognized it. And then sort of delving deeper into this. Oh, and then you've got a data cascade that kind of goes in this direction and this is kind of your I guess most basic model um, of a machine of machine learning and then each individual node will have its a series of inputs and then some kind of transfer function which I think is usually a linear regression and this is also where there's sort of the adjustments in biases and weights, and then it'll have an activation function, which is a decision gate as to whether or not it moves to the output. And the output might be another neuron, or it might be the output output. Activation functions, they learn complex patterns in data. They decide on the data to include in the journey through the layers, and they're usually a continuous range, so you get like a smooth gradient descent. And then a gradient descent is how machine learning models achieves a minimum cost function. And it's a bunch of gentle adjustments to the input of your functions across your nodes. So kind of these things here sort of gently adjust as data moves through them. Oh yeah, I included that there. And then it tries to do this in as few steps as possible. And I kind of imagine it as a bunch of balls just sort of rolling around a hill or something, just sort of gently changing. And then the weights themselves are the fact that the gentle adjustments are uh, governed by a multiple of the negative gradient and the magnitudes of the values um, of the cost function indicate the relative importance of each weight. So it's which ones will have the most impact and be the most efficient when adjusted. And then there's also back propagation, which is something to be aware of. And that's kind of the part of in as few steps as possible. And it's the algorithm which determines how a piece of training data would adjust the weights and biases in terms of what proportions of changes would be most efficient in decreasing cost. And then just something to bear in mind if you kind of if you want to look further into machine learning is the idea of a stochastic gradient descent which is sort of a randomization app applied to gradient descent. And it just makes the computations, I think, more efficient. And then just moving on to the section about audio complexity. So this is just a really quick note that audio is really complex. And this for a machine learning model means that there's potentially thousands of ways and biases to adjust. And there's an argument about adding more layers for deeper learning. But this would lead to instabilities across the model because it will stop um, useful gradient information kind of moving back to the layers near the sort of near the input. And this is known as vanishing gradient. 
And for this specifically for BirdNet, they used ResNet. So the BirdNet build itself, they had a data acquisition, data pre-processing, augmentation, model build and training. Um, for acquisition, one of the challenges was just the sheer amount of data required and the fact that manual verification of the labels would take too much time. So there was incorrectly labeled data included in the training process. The amount of data they used was, I think it was a, sorry, it was definitely 500 recordings for each species and about um, 226 audio files. And then they removed species with less than 10 recordings. And they eventually had a list of 984 species. Another challenge was non-bird noises and then overlapping bird songs and then false positives and signal to noise ratio. So that's where they had very low signals for to high noise. Um, so I guess that's the bird song being very quiet relative to noise that they didn't want. So just sounds that they didn't want, but also digital artifacts in the recordings themselves. So for the soundscapes, they used um, focal recordings and evaluated a model against two data sets of continual lab um, continuously labeled soundscapes. And they just came up with nearly 4,000 hours of audio and a thousand classes. And they trained a neural, they trained the neural network to ignore the sounds. And these were known as non-event classes. They use community project data as well to kind of ground truth um, their soundscapes. So just a quick note here on their sampling, on the sampling rates they use. They use 48 um, hertz and 16 bit, 16 bit resolution, which is great for human beings, but might be different for birds. And I've just got like a little explanation of what those mean. So the sample rate of the audio and it's similar to frame rate in video. So for the 48, that's like 48,000 samples in a recording. And then the bit depth is the number of samples that the audio is broken down to. So it's the amplitudes available via the track and a higher bit means that there's less noise. And then I've got a little comparison here as well which um, I think I'm going to leave. If I send this around, you can sort of listen to the differences in your own time. So I've got a bit on data pre-processing. So they use spectrograms, which is an image of the audio signatures which were captured. And for this, they converted from Hertz to a male scale, which has proven to be um, effective for human speech recognition and they use 64 bands and a cutoff of uh, 1750 hertz. And they tuned the parameters with specifics around the bird vocal and auditory capabilities. And because of the temporal import, um, importance of like bird song itself, so it just goes back to the fact that birds perceive sound differently to how we do. They use the fast, influenced um, their approach to a fast Fourier transformation and there was a tension between preserving data and uh, the compression of the files themselves and that was due to the cost of computing. So I've just got a little bit here on the mouse scale. It's a log transformation of a signal's frequency and it sort of um, mimics how humans perceive sound and it's just Sounds of equal distances on the male scale are just perceived as equal distances to humans. And then the spectrogram itself is a visualization of that scale. And then just a little note that bands is just it's just a frequency range. And then just a little bit on what a fast Fourier transformation does. So it's just a computation of a discrete Fourier transformation. And it's used for things like noise reduction, radio signals, image compression, and it can identify tones in a bit of audio um, mathematically. So I've got a section on durations. It reflected the, the durations they chose were around three seconds and it reflected the expected duration of a bird vocalization. 
and it just facilitated the data augmentation. And then they use signal strength estimation as well. So the location of the bird signals in the recording were always available. And it was around finding target signals in bits of audio because of the training on weekly labeled data. Sorry, my animations here are a little bit off. Um, they developed a detector based on signal strength. Sorry. Um, I'm just going to move on. And they, right, so they randomized shifts in frequency and time, and the, these had better valuation scores. They also randomized and um, stretched across the time and frequency. So these are the things that they actually did to the images once they had sort of converted the audio signatures. And this is sim so the randomizing uh, partial stretching in time and frequency is similar to what's done in human speech recognition. And the noise from samples were rejected. Some of the noise from samples were rejected in pre-processing, which was found to be a powerful augmentation. And then I've just got this really cool image here of what that looks like. So we've got kind of the input there. So that's the sound after it's been captured and then converted onto a male scale and then captured as an image. And then you can see here where they've walked it just kind of how different that looks and just how that's been stretched out. And it's just, if you imagine sound being walked and kind of like sounding slower and just a bit odd. And the tones and the frequencies just kind of being a bit off. And then they use vertical roll here, which you can kind of see how that's all been squished up in comparison to that. And then just the addition of noise here, which you can kind of see these artifacts. And yeah, it's just, that's a bit that I just found really interesting, like quite cool, really. And then the actual model build itself, they used ResNet. I've not gone into a huge amount of detail on the model build because I was just conscious of the time. But effectively, uh, the reasons why they used it was it was scalable across the width and the depth. So if you imagine, if you remember back to that first, um, well, the second schematic I showed you. Hang on, I'm going to come out of this and go back to it for a second. So this kind of direction here that I think of as the width. So the more nodes there are along this sort of direction is the width. And then the number of layers, so moving from left to right, is the depth. Then, so it was scalable in those directions. It was an easy implementation. Um, it gave similar performance compared to deep architectures. So, you know, the depth of the layers. And then they went with 157 layers and 36 of those were weighted. Uh, they did it in three parts. So there was a pre-processing block of the transformed input spectrogram. So that would be these bits here. And then they had a sequence of residual stacks and the classification block. The residual stacks included some downsampling and then regular residuals. And these are blocks which are capable of adding inputs of a previous layer to a later layer. And this is the section where the actual feature extraction of the audio happened and then a classification block with some time step predictions and some log mean exponential pooling. And then just for reference, I've just kind of put in what they had in their paper of what the whole architecture looked like. So for those interested, you can kind of see they use a lot of ReLU activations, which is a kind of activation that can kind of pass information, can back propagate information. And then the training they used um, in the region of 1.5 million spectrograms. They followed best practice as explained by Francois Cholet. Um, they used about, 
I think, 3,000 samples. And then uh, they oversampled underrepresented classes. So the performance itself, the model could replicate patterns generated by human observer data. So it could do as humans could. Um, the quality of the soundscapes recording um, affected the detection performance. So just how busy the soundscapes were and then also how well captured they were with um, signal to noise, lower signal to noise ratios of received calls. Um, so if the bird song was relatively quiet compared to the noise, caused a reduction in performance. Uh, yeah, lower signal to noise caused performance issues. And then the data augmentation didn't always ameliorate the quality issues from low recorded sound. So the number of recordings in the species also didn't mean better recognition. It was kind of on how good the sound was in the first place when it was captured. So yeah, high data recordings improve recognition. Um, it was difficult regardless for the birds which sound similar. Um, and then noisy training data usually decrease the performance of any species. And then the labeling. So yeah, they might have included some incorrect labeling meant that non-bird events could be in the training data. And this would impact the species with less training data the most. And also could affect evaluation due to a lack of consistency with the time segments. So the things which have been identified um, as potential areas of improvement are precision and recall. So precision is the proportion of detections correctly classified relative to the total detections of uh, target species. And recall is the proportion of detections from a target species out of a number of vocalizations of the species in the recording. And the difference is really what a false positive looks like and what a false negative looks like. So precision was high in most, oh, this is called bird net in the wild because this is kind of about the use of bird net in other studies. Um, and precision was high in most of the studies, but it varies across species and the performance for the same species varied across studies. Um, and the recommendations were bird net precision should be estimated for every target species in each study and discretion should be used in extrapolating bird net classification accuracy among species or studies. There may be a trade-off between recall and precision. Recall is generally low. Um, it was half the average precision estimated in most studies and but it was the impact of low precision to ecological studies would be worse. And then there's a section on the confidence threshold, which is something Birdnet imposed on itself. And it's a scoring system between zero and three, where three means more confidence in recognizing and detecting birdsong. So the recall rate dropped as confidence values increased. Um, precision increases with a higher confidence score. Um, a confidence score of 0.5 reduced the number of bird net detections, but a different study concluded that a range of, I think, averaging 0.75 is a good range for research. Um, yeah, and you saw increased precisions at uh, 0.5. And then, yeah, there's a need to assess on a species by species and study by study basis. And a lower confidence score increases recall, but lowers precision. And lower confidence scores may need manual intervention. So there was some good practice in this uh, papers I read. So evaluating performance, evaluate, um, validating output, so that could be the manual labeling or ground truthing, 
uh, estimating precision, uh, assessing precision and assessing recall. And then also there's some potential areas for research here. So the causes of variation in the precision, the performance of the birds and the sounds themselves, both quantitatively, so how many instances are being recorded, and then also in terms of quality, so the data captured in the recordings themselves. Um, the use of longer recordings, um, estimating recalls, confidence scoring, assessing confidence scoring, because that's not something that's been studied in too much, um, how to improve outcomes for large data sets, um, looking at population densities, the distance of the birds themselves from the microphones when the recordings are being taken, um, what bird net could look like on other continents, and then the impact of overlap and sensitivity, so kind of the different birds and they're all singing all over each other. And then also just um, geographical variation. So the idea that birds might have different accents in different um, regions. And then I did some science. So, yep, that's just me recording bird song on the weekend. And I've got some recordings here which I downsampled to MP3s just to kind of give an idea of what the was being analysed. So here is what a soundscape near the cafe and play area right label. So did you all hear that? It was very low on my speakers, but I could hear it, yes. Okay. So, hang on. So that's at an MP3 quality. So quite a lot of data has been thrown away by the down conversion. But also in terms of the soundscape itself, you can hear sort of other noises. You can hear birds, but you can also hear children crying. You can hear a dog barking. And then there's just a lot of digital artifacts on that. And then just here. Again, you can kind of hear that's also been downsampled. You can hear some digital artifacts on that, um, but you can also hear the sound of someone walking as well as the bird song. And then I'm just going to move to Chrome now because I did do a little, um, I did experiment a little bit with it in Google Colab. I've had to do it in advance because I've got two bars of internet and it just takes a really long time. But you need to set your base directory, install Librosa and then install TensorFlow. And then I imported Librosa, but I don't think you really need to do that. And then also install FMPEG, which is just a series of codecs. Um, which BirdNet needs in order to kind of handle different audio codecs. And then I used the Ubuntu installation because the sort of standard Python installation didn't really work for Colab. So I just cloned the GitHub and then changed the directory. And then you can see where I did try and install on just using a Python installation. And then I used Python Analyze, set my input and my output. It found the files in the folder, in the input folder, and then analyzed them and popped them in the output folder. And I can show you what one of them look like. Um, yeah, so it found a house sparrow, it found a collar dove, it found a house sparrow, and I was pretty confident that those were the birds 
because I actually saw them. But then if I look at, I think, number 10. Yeah, it found a load of gold finches, which I was less convinced about. But then there was one in particular where it found it found the robin and the house finch, but then it sort of mislabeled a Eurasian magpie as an Australian magpie. And yeah, that's what the output looks like. It sort of gives you the selection confidence there. And then I've yet to understand what these columns mean. Then I think That's the end of my presentation. There's just a video of a window set up because I did do the installation of the program, but it made my laptop free, so I'm not going to demonstrate that. And then just a link to the details on the GitHub. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. Well, thank you, Sophie. Um, that was a good overview. It felt like you were going really fast through some of those slides, but we have plenty of time for questions, actually. Um, does anyone have a question that they'd like to ask Sophie? Yeah, it's really good. Thanks, Sophie. That all, all really came together. Um, the, does it offer you options for file input or is it just MP3? Because that seems to be a bit of an Achilles heel. It wouldn't accept the M4As um, that I originally recorded because I I use my go I use my Google phone basically oh, yeah. and I couldn't see anywhere in the documentation where it could accept any other file okay. and a lot of the material which they had taken um, as part of their training data I presume was something along the lines of MP3 because. Mm they had taken it from three pre-existing collections yeah. um, and then from community science projects as well, where some of it was recorded with sort of high quality microphones, but it seemed mm. that a lot would be sort of citizen science. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I, um, <laughs> whilst, whilst you were chatting away through that part about how they're doing pre-processing and stuff, I was thinking, oh, this is great, but you sort of, the, the horse has already bolted because a lot of the, the information's missing. So I, I did a quick uh, chat GPT and apparently there's a new feature which uh, we could test out this very moment if anybody wants to try this for me. And this is, uh, this is what chat GPT had to say about this, this topic as a result of me asking it. So I don't know if that will open for people. Oh, yeah, I'm reading that now. Yeah, like I was kind of thinking about it as I was reading it and sort of wondering, so they did a whole process where they kind of layered non-bird sounds over focal recordings. And I'm just wondering if there's sort of scope to do something similar, but with like high quality recordings and sort of that layering of non-bird sound, because then you might sort of get this, um, you know, more data. Yeah, in the, the, the trouble is that it's not just about making the training set, is it? What you've got to consider, how are people going to then feed in data for inference? And I guess MP3 is, most people, you know, g given the cost of bandwidth and everything, that's that's what it would be. But uh, it'd be really interesting to 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 run it with uncompressed. You know, and that would be like ten times more data in terms of uh, bits and bytes. But really interesting to see if it worked better without compression. Yeah, like especially when you consider that sort of increasing their repertoire didn't necessarily lead to any performance gains. So it might be in the whole having the actual sort of bulk of the data in the recording itself. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, any other questions? I have a couple of questions. Oh, Shimek. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to observe that uh, if there is a uh, recording from a mobile phone, uh, it, it's apart from it being an MP3, uh it mobile phones do 
Additionally, do some tricks on the recording process, some sort of speech filtering. Uh, I don't know what else. Uh, so <laughs> there can be an additional problem, but Matt was very right saying that it's not enough to have a perfect training material. Uh, this training material must be uh, then sort of directed onto what's going to be fed into the model later. Yeah, but it was a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shannon. Yeah, so like one of the challenges I sort of recognize I had was because I was using my mobile phone and that was an M4A, which is better than MP3, but it's kind of the kind of sound you get off video. So I recognize that by downsampling it further to an MP3, I was actually reducing the quality even more. So that was just it was just an interesting thing to be aware of. I think a thing that I would say about the file types is that, um, you know, I've just had a an experience. I'm, I am experiencing something with a different kind of AI model right now, where we um, we <clears throat> this is a computer vision model, and we're collecting pictures that will be used in a classification algorithm, and um, we were giving samples of our um experimental data to the group that is is actually making the predictions based on the pictures and uh they cast their human eye over it and they said yeah these pictures are good but we'd like them to be better that's kind of the way they put it and um one of the things that we want to keep in mind sometimes with uh ai models is that <clears throat> The uh, human perception has limitations, and the features like the resolution of data and like the maybe a completely lossless recording or maybe a high um, um, signal to noise ratio, it may not be that important for good predictions. Um, so for bird song, I also like the aesthetic ideal of having a perfect you know, clean, high, full fat, you know, 32 bit depth, uh, you know, 48 kilohertz um, sample rate. I love that idea, but <clears throat> if the um, features are not necessary to make a prediction um, and you get a much smaller file size, uh, it's probably, it would be better if, if the model runs faster with smaller data and you lose 1% of precision or something and it, probably it's that kind of decision that's been you know made through iterations kind of question i had um sophie is uh, about the input i was real interested in your test of the um of the data and does uh, for those recordings you did is there any kind of limit or a guideline on the length of the recording that you put in to get the predictions out can you say a little bit about that? You you got MP4s off your camera and uh, you converted them. I, I kind of missed that part. Did you convert them yourself to MP3s or did does the, the um, software itself do that? And how long are they? Um, no, I downsampled them myself. I just wrote a little program in Python that would do that for me. Um, and then... I ended up doing them, they were between seven and 14 seconds long, the recordings I took, because it was partly just to, just my own reaction times really, in sort of seeing a bird, hearing a bird and getting my phone to like record it. But then also it just seemed to yield some predictions um when they were sort of around 10 seconds like when they were shorter it just it would tend to focus more on the sounds which weren't bird song and then also incorrectly guess those sounds as well surprising amount of surprising amount of gunshot was being sort of guessed um <clears throat> i think uh i think i, I have been thinking about you know your project and how I would like to use BirdNet, and I was thinking of a workflow where uh, we have some devices. Um, I have one available now. If if you want to play with it at some point in the future, 
that captures wave files. Um, so kind of full fat CD quality, and you can set it to record the dong chorus. Um, and, and then you, you have uh, pros and cons with a big recording of the dong chorus. So pro is that you've got lots of data to work on, and you have this snapshot of probably a good sample of species, but a downside is you have that big old file that you have to handle, and you could write a little Python program to cut it into bite-sized pieces and downsample it. That would be one way, or you could look for, also with a very small Python program, you could look for places where there's a lot of energy in the um, in it, where, where there's some sound and a snippet a few seconds on either side, and then put those pieces through. And uh, I was thinking, you know, you might be able to calculate the biodiversity of the dog chorus. Uh, if, you, if you had a workflow that do that to do that, it's one of the things you went by quite quickly in your presentation was um, the validation. Uh, so if you have a low probability prediction, I think you kind of said um, that maybe human validation would be required. And for just one bird recording, that's no problem. You can just listen to a few seconds, but for a you know, two hour dong chorus and you've got, you know, a hundred ambiguous ones, it starts to become a lot of work. Has yes. anyone, Sophie, in your thing, did you come across the um, the program BirdNet, the app that is like the consumer app? You went to collab. Yeah, I did. I did played with play it, with yeah. It? How did you find its uh, performance? Um... not that different to um just recording it and in collab but i was using it again i was using it off my phone so sometimes it found it difficult to hear birdsong if it was really faint so i could hear it but i could tell the bird was like really high up in a tree and if it was windy it seemed to it found that more difficult to kind of pick up on the fact that there was a bird there. But this was in a park, like at dusk. It's, um, the thing about, um, the, one of the things I noticed on your, <clears throat> on your implementation from the GitHub, I guess that was the official bird net. Yeah. Uh, so the th one of the things that you mentioned that I thought was interesting, um, and I, my, my mind was instantly trying to find, think of a solution to a problem or what's a likely solution to this problem, is you picked up an Australian magpie, uh, yeah. which is very unlikely, you know, as, as just as you noticed. And um, in the, the like, so there are several ways to, to think about this. If they've trained BirdNet on, I think you said about 900 and something bird species, so uh, most of the most common species, I guess, all over the place. We could use transfer learning to add some new species in, or you can, uh, when you have those predictions, if you come up with probably behind the scenes somewhere, there'd be a way to, I, pr I presume when you got four predictions, that all four were predicted, and for that one sound, one prediction was made, and they, there's some sort of internal algorithm that gives the most likely of the options, ju just like in a normal, just like in a normal classification problem. But um, I wonder if there would be a way that would be easy to capture all of the options that you got and weight them against the likelihood that you you are actually hearing that bird. So if you get a bird um, based on the sound that is very unlikely to be there. You could you could uh, weight the the prediction against that. There must be a way to do that. Have you come across that? Did you come across it in the? Yes, there is um, kind of. There's something in there where you can, um, in the coding itself, select the location and the date oh, okay. and time. So yeah. it's sort of you know if I sort of set the Latin long to. <clears throat> you know, a park in Bristol, it probably would have said it's unlikely to be an Australian magpie due to the fact you're not in Australia. Yes, exactly that. I think um, 
if people haven't used BirdNet or haven't heard of it and are interested in it in any way, it's very easy, um, I say in double quotes, to uh, install it from the the GitHub repo. If you if you have a if you have um, any tips on that, or or did you just follow the the repo um, instructions for the Windows install? Um, I did. You need to put in fmpeg if you're doing it from Windows. Yeah. And that's that's a little bit of a faff. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's I've included in the presentation. There's like a little video on how to do that. And you did um, it all local on your laptop. Yes. The only thing is, I mean, I, I appreciate my laptop is just a bit unhappy with the world at the moment, but opening up the program did make it freeze horribly, like a couple of <laughs> times. Is, was it, were you using it in like um, Jupyter Lab? No, this was the actual, so they've got like an actual program itself. Oh, okay. Yeah, but in Colab, it was mostly fine. Mm. I had to use the Ubuntu instructions for putting it in Colab rather than the um, Python instructions. But and Matt helped me out a lot with that. Well, but yeah, the... that... oh, go on. No, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Sorry. What I was going to say is that um, I, I actually haven't tried the a standalone app for the PC, but. Uh, an implementation of there is a standalone app for Android phones, I presume for Apple as well. That's the BirdNet app, and it it's okay, it's okay. But the one that I really like that has had a recent update is um, I don't know if you'll be able to see that on my phone. Maybe I'll take off my blur a blur option and try to attempt to do this with um this probably will never work in a million years but i'll try it anyway meeting options let's see blur options <clears throat> i don't even know why i oh there we go all right no effect okay all right so if i show you this there's a little bird i'm going to put my finger over here by it on this side of my phone it's right there and that's the um, the Merlin app. Is that, okay, it's backwards, isn't it, for you, or is that just for me? So that's what the nice. Merlin app looks like. And if I click on it and open it, uh, you get um, the option to uh, start a bird ID, and it takes you through a series of questions. You can do it from a photo that you've taken, and there's an AI classification for photo. You do it from sound. Um, so if you do it from sound, you get a, a screen that looks like that, and it's an app that just automatically records and puts it in the right folder. And if you go to one, I'll try to play you one that I've done. I don't have a lot of recordings saved on here, but see if you can you can hear this. Is that coming through at all? No, no, nothing, nothing. Is that coming through? No. No. Well, the uh, point of it is, is that uh, it's a thing that they've done. The way the app functions now is you make a live recording. And um, this was a, a house sparrow sitting next to us. And I was just playing around. Uh, but I like the fact that you get a spectrogram while you're recording, and uh, it's pretty accurate, and it's also very aesthetically pleasing for the um, for the birds, and it's a way to get a feel for the accuracy. And the way that that it works within the Merlin app is they have what they call bird packs, and you just pick, uh, you know, Great Britain and Western Europe, and and it can be any one of about 550 birds. If you go to North America, I was in Florida and there are about 600 birds there. Um, and you wait, you wait the predictions based on that. Um, can we, we have five minutes left. Any, if there, 
Are there any final questions for Sophie? I'm going to put you on the spot massively, but I'm going to um, I'm going to compliment your fine looking paint job before I do that, Sophie. I saw you oh, I saw you, you tweet much. I saw you tweeting about it and it does look I meant to say that before I forget. But here's my question. Can in five minutes, can you talk a little bit about what you hope to achieve in your project? Because it's going to involve BirdNet. Have you thought about that a little bit? Have you uh, have you started thinking about the shape of it? Um, well, kind of. I thought mm -hmm. something around precision would be interesting. Mm -hmm. But then I also quite like the idea that you just mentioned of putting um, a box out in the field um, measuring wavs. But I need to sort of think about practically how that could work. Um, I was quite interested in how using a file with more data, because especially if we're kind of adding it to the lens of um, using it in agriculture to see whether or not farming, um, the stuff farmers are doing to try and improve biodiversity outcomes is actually working. I think precision increases would be really useful in that. There's also already something on the market called Chirrup AI, which is a company that are sort of trying to do precisely that. Um, I think I've sort of tailed off because my thoughts are very garbled. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned Chirrup AI because I was going to mention them, that they have had a, a little bit of a, a media blast in the ag community. And uh, the way that I think it's likely that Chirrup, they, they kind of sell it as we have a magic box. Yeah. We give you our magic box. And then from our magic box, you will get a report that will, um, that will uh, tick that fat box for DEFRA. And you're going to get the fattest paycheck of your life for absolutely no work. We'll do it all for you. That's kind of like that's me being slightly disrespectful. It's it's hard to be too disrespectful to entrepreneurs. That's me being slightly um, flippant about, you know, paraphrasing their business model. And I was trying to look into where the AI is. You know, they're on the dot AI uh, domain on the internet. And I yeah. was looking through their website, where is your AI? And what I think that they do, what I think that company does is they've taken a, an open source piece of hardware. I think they use one called the Audio Moth. And I think they've branded it with a, with a silicon cover on it. And I think they have a real person that takes out this recording device. That's all the Audio Moth is, is a recording device. And they have that person go back in two weeks that's the battery life of the um, audio moth for Don Choruses. They take the, that recording, and I bet that they have a BirdNet commercial account, and then they're uploading their account and getting a list of species off those Don Choruses, and then they've just got a pretty report that they use with bird pictures on it. No, I, I think there's very little AI in that company. I think they're probably just leveraging BirdNet or or something very similar, but probably BirdNet because that's the one that works the best that I'm aware of. <clears throat> but I don't know. I, I think doing a test of uh, how well the technology works would be uh, plenty for a, a project. Is just deciding how to act, ask a good and compelling question. That's a million dollar question for me, Ed, really. <laughs> like, yeah. Do you want to do of... more programming kind of stuff and computer experiments, or do you want to do more bird recording and biodiversity kind of uh, measurements? I mean, that, that's a, we could start with something that simple to help guide you. Yeah. If it could be sort of half and half, I'd be appreciative. Just half and with, half. Yeah. Okay. Just with the whole dream Keep of going to go open. outside. Well, it's just, open. 
Well, it's more, I quite like the programmy stuff, but then I also quite like going outside. Yeah. Um, well, we're out of time. Any final comments, declarations, protestations? No? Do you need to run off, Ed? It's um, it's five o'clock. You want to stay around and chat for five minutes or so? Yeah, that's OK. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll, I'll hang, when we close this, I'll call you right back. OK, great. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks for coming. As usual, let me turn off the video. Let's all thank Sophie for a um, nice talk and fantastic slides and a great paint job. Is that a uh, is that a living elkhorn fern or a staghorn fern above your head there? It is, yes. Okay, it's very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. See you around. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We'll see, you. Thanks, see everyone later. Bye bye. I'll bye. call you right back, Sophie.